Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, part of the Catholic Culture Podcast Network and the only podcast bringing to life classic Catholic works through professional, high-quality audiobook recordings. Stay up to date with our latest podcast releases by signing up for our newsletter at catholicculture.org slash get audio. Today's reading, Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 3, Chapters 36 through 41, by St. Francis de Sales, narrated by James T. Majewski. Chapter 36. A Well-Balanced, Reasonable Mind Reason is the special characteristic of man, and yet it is a rare thing to find really reasonable men, all the more that self-love hinders reason and beguiles us insensibly into all manner of trifling but yet dangerous acts of injustice and untruth, which, like the little foxes in the canticles, spoil our vines while, just because they are trifling, people pay no attention to them, and because they are numerous, they do infinite harm. Let me give some instances of what I mean. We find fault with our neighbor very readily for a small matter, while we pass over great things in ourselves. We strive to sell dear and buy cheap. We are eager to deal out strict justice to others, but to obtain indulgence for ourselves. We expect a good construction to be put on all we say, but we are sensitive and critical as to our neighbor's words. We expect him to let us have whatever we want for money, when it would be more reasonable to let him keep that which is his if he desires to do so, and leave us to keep our gold. We are vexed with him because he will not accommodate us, while perhaps he has better reason to be vexed with us for wanting to disturb him. If we have a liking for any one particular thing, we despise all else and reject whatever does not precisely suit our taste. If some inferior is unacceptable to us, or we have once caught him in error, he is sure to be wrong in our eyes whatever he may do, and we are forever thwarting or looking coldly on him, while, on the other hand, someone who happens to please us is sure to be right. Sometimes even parents show unfair preference for a child endowed with personal gifts over one afflicted with some physical imperfection. We put the rich before the poor, although they may have less claim and be less worthy. We even give preference to well-dressed people. We are strict in exacting our own rights, but expect others to be yielding as to theirs. We complain freely of our neighbors, but we do not like them to make any complaints of us. Whatever we do for them appears very great in our sight, but what they do for us counts as nothing. In a word, we are like the Paphlagonian partridge, which has two hearts. For we have a very tender, pitiful, easy heart towards ourselves, and one which is hard, harsh, and strict towards our neighbor. We have two scales, one with which to measure our own goods to the best advantage, and the other to weigh our neighbors to the worst. Holy Scripture tells us that lying lips are an abomination unto the Lord, and the double heart with one measure whereby to receive and another to give, is also abominable in his sight. Be just and fair in all you do. Always put yourself in your neighbor's place and put him into yours, and then you will judge fairly. Sell as you would buy, and buy as you would sell, and your buying and selling will alike be honest. These little dishonesties seem unimportant, because we are not obliged to make restitution, and we have, after all, only taken that which we might demand according to the strict letter of the law. But nevertheless, they are sins against right and charity, and are mere trickery, greatly needing correction. Nor does anyone ever lose by being generous, noble-hearted, and courteous. Be sure, then, often to examine your dealings with your neighbor, whether your heart is right towards him, as you would have his towards you, were things reversed. This is the true test of reason. When Trajan was blamed by his confidential friends for making the imperial presence too accessible, he replied, Does it not behoove me to strive to be such an emperor towards my subjects as I should wish to meet with were I a subject? Chapter 37 Wishes. Everybody grants that we must guard against the desire for evil things, since evil desires make evil men. 
But I say yet further, my child, do not desire dangerous things, such as balls or pleasures, office or honor, visions or ecstasies. Do not long after things afar off, such, I mean, as cannot happen until a distant time, as some do who by this means wear themselves out and expend their energies uselessly, fostering a dangerous spirit of distraction. If a young man gives way to overweening longings for an employment he cannot obtain yet a while, what good will it do him? If a married woman sets her heart on becoming a religious, or if I crave to buy my neighbor's estate, he not being willing to sell it, is it not mere waste of time? If, when sick, I am restlessly anxious to preach or celebrate, to visit other sick people, or generally do work befitting the strong, is it not an unprofitable desire, inasmuch as I have no power to fulfill it? And meanwhile, these useless wishes take the place of such as I ought to have, namely, to be patient, resigned, self-denying, obedient, gentle under suffering, which are what God requires of me under the circumstances. We are too apt to be like a sickly woman, craving ripe cherries in autumn and grapes in spring. I can never think it well for one whose vocation is clear to waste time in wishing for some different manner of life than that which is adapted to his duty, or practices unsuitable to his present position. It is mere idling, and will make him slack in his necessary work. If I long after a Carthusian solitude, I am losing my time, and such longing usurps the place of that which I ought to entertain, to fulfill my actual duties rightly. No, indeed, I would not even have people wish for more wit or better judgment, for such desires are frivolous and take the place of the wish everyone ought to possess of improving what he has. We ought not to desire ways of serving God that he does not open to us, but rather desire to use what we have rightly. Of course, I mean by this real earnest desires, not common superficial wishes, which do no harm if not too frequently indulged. Do not desire crosses, unless you have borne those already laid upon you well. It is an abuse to long after martyrdom while unable to bear an insult patiently. The enemy of souls often inspires men with ardent desires for unattainable things in order to divert their attention from present duties, which would be profitable however trifling in themselves. We are apt to fight African monsters in imagination, while we let very petty foes vanquish us in reality for want of due heed. Do not desire temptations, that is temerity, but prepare your heart to meet them bravely and to resist them when they come. Too great variety and quantity of food loads the stomach and, especially when it is weakly, spoils the digestion. Do not overload your soul with innumerable longings, either worldly, for that were destruction, or even spiritual, for these only burden you. When the soul is purged of the evil diseases of sin, it experiences a ravenous hunger for spiritual things, and sets to work as one famished at all manner of spiritual exercises, mortification, penitence, humility, charity, prayer. Doubtless such an appetite is a good sign, but it benefits you to reflect whether you are able to digest all that you willingly would eat. Make, rather, a selection from all these desires, under the guidance of your spiritual father, of such as you are able to perform, and then use them as perfectly as you are able. When you have done this, God will send you more, to be fulfilled in their turn, and so you will not waste time in unprofitable wishes. Not that I would have you lose any good desires, but rather treat them methodically, putting them aside in one corner of your heart till due time comes, while you carry out such as are ripe for action. And this counsel I give to worldly people as well as to those who are spiritual, for without heeding it, no one can avoid anxiety and over-eagerness. Chapter 38 Counsels to Married People Marriage is a great sacrament both in Jesus Christ and His Church, and one to be honored to all, by all, and in all. To all, for even those who do not enter upon it should honor it in all humility. By all, for it is holy alike to poor as to rich. In all, for its origin, its end, its form, and matter are holy. 
It is the nursery of Christianity, whence the earth is peopled with faithful till the number of the elect in heaven be perfected, so that respect for the marriage tie is exceedingly important to the commonwealth, of which it is the source and supply. Would to God that his dear son were invited to all weddings as to that of Cana. Truly, then, the wine of consolation and blessing would never be lacking. For if these are often so wanting, it is because too frequently now men summon Adonis instead of our Lord, and Venus rather than Our Lady. He who desires that the young of his flock should be like Jacob's, fair and ring-straked, must set fair objects before their eyes. And he who would find a blessing in his marriage must ponder the holiness and dignity of this sacrament, instead of which too often weddings become a season of mere feasting and disorder. Above all, I would exhort all married people to seek that mutual love so commended to them by the Holy Spirit in the Bible. It is little to bid you love one another with a mutual love. Turtle doves do that. Or with human love. The heathen cherished such love as that. But I say to you, in the apostles' words, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. It was God who brought Eve to our first father Adam and gave her to him to wife, and even so, my friends, it is God's invisible hand that binds you in the sacred bonds of marriage. It is He who gives you one to the other, therefore cherish one another with a holy, sacred, heavenly love. The first effect of this love is the indissoluble union of your hearts. If you glue together two pieces of wood, provided that the glue be strong, their union will be so close that the stick will break more easily in any other part than where it is joined. Now God unites husband and wife so closely in himself that it should be easier to sunder soul from body than husband from wife. Nor is this union to be considered as mainly of the body, but yet more a union of the heart, its affections, and love. The second effect of this love should be an inviolable fidelity to one another. In olden times, finger rings were customarily graven as seals. We read of it in Holy Scripture, and this explains the meaning of the marriage ceremony when the church, by the hand of her priest, blesses a ring and gives it first to the man in token that she sets a seal on his heart by this sacrament so that no thought of any other woman may ever enter therein so long as she, who now is given to him, shall live. Then the bridegroom places the ring on the bride's hand so that she in turn may know that she must never conceive any affection in her heart for any other man so long as he shall live, who is now given to her by our Lord himself. The third end of marriage is the birth and bringing up of children. And herein, O oh married people, are you greatly honored in that God, willing to multiply souls to bless and praise him to all eternity, associates you with himself in this his work by the production of bodies into which like dew from heaven, he infuses the souls he creates as well as the bodies into which they enter. Therefore, husbands, do you preserve a tender, constant, sincere love for your wives. It was that the wife might be loved heartily and tenderly that woman was taken from the side nearest Adam's heart. No failings or infirmities, bodily or mental, in your wife should ever excite any kind of dislike in you, but rather a loving, tender compassion, and that because God has made her dependent on you and bound to defer to and obey you, and that while she is meant to be your helpmate, you are her superior and her head. And on your part, wives, do you love the husbands God has given you tenderly, heartily, but with a reverential, confiding love? For God has made the man to have the predominance and be the stronger, and he wills the woman to depend upon him, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, taking her from out the ribs of the man to show that she must be subject to his guidance. All Holy Scripture enjoins this subjection, which nevertheless is not grievous, and the same Holy Scripture, while it bids you accept it lovingly, bids your husband to use his superiority with great tenderness, loving kindness, and gentleness. Likewise, you husbands, live considerately with your wives, bestowing honor on the woman as the weaker sex. But while you seek diligently to foster this mutual love, 
give good heed that it do not turn to any manner of jealousy. Just as the worm is often hatched in the sweetest and ripest apple, so too often jealousy springs up in the most warm and loving hearts, defiling and ruining them, and if it is allowed to take root, it will produce dissension, quarrels, and separation. Of a truth, jealousy never arises where love is built up on true virtue, and therefore it is a sure sign of an earthly, sensual love in which mistrust and inconstancy is soon infused. It is a sorry kind of friendship that seeks to strengthen itself by jealousy, for though jealousy may be a sign of strong, hot friendship, it is certainly no sign of a good, pure, perfect attachment, and that because perfect love implies absolute trust in the person loved, whereas jealousy implies uncertainty. If you, husbands, would have your wives faithful, be it yours to set them the example. How have you the face to exact purity from your wives, asks St. Gregory Nazianzen, if you yourselves live an impure life, or how can you require that which you do not give in return? If you would have them chaste, let your own conduct to them be chaste. St. Paul bids you possess your vessel in sanctification, but if, on the contrary, you teach them evil, no wonder that they dishonor you. And ye, O women, whose honor is inseparable from modesty and purity, preserve it jealously, and never allow the smallest speck to soil the whiteness of your reputation. Shrink sensitively from the littlest trifles that can touch it. Never permit any gallantries whatsoever. Suspect any who presume to flatter your beauty or grace, for when men praise wares they cannot purchase, they are often tempted to steal. And if anyone should dare to speak in disparagement of your husband, show that you are irrecoverably offended, for it is plain that he not only seeks your fall, but he counts you as half-fallen, since the bargain with the newcomer is half-made when one is disgusted with the first merchant. Ladies both in ancient and modern times have worn pearls in their ears, for the sake, so says Pliny, of hearing them tinkle against each other. But remembering how that friend of God, Isaac, sent earrings as first pledges of his love to the chaste Rebecca, I look upon this mystic ornament as signifying that the first claim a husband has over his wife, and one that she ought most faithfully to keep for him, is her ear, so that no evil word or rumor enter therein, and nothing be heard save the pleasant sound of true and pure words, which are represented by the choice pearls of the gospel. Never forget that souls are poisoned through the ear as much as bodies through the mouth. Love and faithfulness lead to familiarity and confidence, and saints have abounded in tender caresses. Isaac and Rebekah, the type of chaste married life, indulged in such caresses as to convince Abimelech that they must be husband and wife. The great Saint Louis, strict as he was to himself, was so tender towards his wife that some were ready to blame him for it, although in truth he rather deserved praise for subjecting his lofty, martial mind to the little details of conjugal love. Such minor matters will not suffice to knit hearts, but they tend to draw them closer and promote mutual happiness. Before giving birth to St. Augustine, St. Monica offered him repeatedly to God's glory, as he himself tells us, and it is a good lesson for Christian women how to offer the fruit of their womb to God, who accepts the free oblations of loving hearts and promotes the desires of such faithful mothers. Witness Samuel, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Andrea de Fiesole, and others. St. Bernard's mother, worthy of such a son, was accustomed to take her newborn babes in her arms to offer them to Jesus Christ, thenceforward loving them with a reverential love as a sacred deposit from God. And so entirely was her offering accepted that all her seven children became saints. And when children begin to use their reason, fathers and mothers should take great pains to fill their hearts with the fear of God. This the good Queen Blanche did most earnestly by St. Louis, her son. Witness her oft-repeated words, My son, I would sooner see you die than guilty of a mortal sin. Words that sank so deeply into the saintly monarch's heart that he himself said there was no day on which they did not recur to his mind and strengthen him in treading God's ways. We call races and generations houses, and the Hebrews were accustomed to speak of the birth of children as the building up of the house, as it is written of the Jewish midwives in Egypt that the Lord made them houses, whereby we learn that a good house 
is not reared so much by the accumulation of worldly goods as by the bringing up of children in the ways of holiness and of God. And to this end, no labor or trouble must be spared, for children are the crown of their parents. Thus it was that St. Monica steadfastly withstood St. Augustine's evil propensities, and, following him across sea and land, he became more truly the child of her tears in the conversion of his soul than the son of her body in his natural birth. St. Paul assigns the charge of the household to the woman, and consequently some hold that the devotion of the family depends more upon the wife than the husband, who is more frequently absent and has less influence in the house. Certainly, King Solomon in the book of Proverbs refers all household prosperity to the care and industry of that virtuous woman whom he describes. We read in Genesis that Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, or as the Hebrews read it, he prayed over against her on opposite sides of the place of prayer, and his prayer was granted. That is the most fruitful union between husband and wife that is founded in devotion to which they should mutually stimulate one another. There are certain fruits, like the quince, of so bitter a quality that they are scarcely edible save when preserved, while others again, like cherries and apricots, are so delicate and soft that they can only be kept by the same treatment. So the wife must seek that her husband be sweetened with the sugar of devotion, for man without religion is a rude, rough animal, and the husband will desire to see his wife devout, as without it, her frailty and weakness are liable to tarnish and injury. St. Paul says that the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Because in so close a tie, one may easily draw the other to what is good. And how great is the blessing on those faithful husbands and wives who confirm one another continually in the fear of the Lord. Moreover, each should have such forbearance towards the other that they never grow angry or fall into discussion and argument. The bee will not dwell in a spot where there is much loud noise or shouting or echo. Neither will God's Holy Spirit dwell in a household where altercation and tumult, arguing and quarreling, disturb the peace. St. Gregory Nazianzen says that in his time, married people were accustomed to celebrate the anniversary of their wedding, and it is a custom I should greatly approve, provided it were not a merely secular celebration, but if husbands and wives would go on that day to confession and communion and commend their married life specially to God, renewing their resolution to promote mutual good by increased love and faithfulness, and thus take breath, so to say, and gather new vigor from the Lord to go on steadfastly in their vocation. Chapter 39 The Sanctity of the Marriage Bed the marriage bed should be undefiled, as the Apostle tells us, in other words, pure, as it was when it was first instituted in the earthly paradise, in which no unruly desires or impure thought might enter. All that is merely earthly must be treated as means to fulfill the end God sets before his creatures. Thus we eat in order to preserve life, moderately, voluntarily, and without seeking an undue, unworthy satisfaction therefrom. The appointed time has grown very short, says St. Paul. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. Let everyone, then, use this world according to his vocation, but so as not to entangle himself with its love, that he may be as free and ready to serve God as though he used it not. St. Augustine says that it is the great fault of men to want to enjoy things that they are only meant to use, and to use those that they are only meant to enjoy. We ought to enjoy spiritual things, and only use those that are material. But when we turn the use of these latter into enjoyment, the reasonable soul becomes degraded to a mere brutish level. Chapter 40 Counsels to Widows St. Paul teaches us all in the person of St. Timothy when he says, Honor widows who are real widows. Now to be a real widow, it is necessary that the widow be one not in body only, but in heart also. That is to say, that she be fixed in an unalterable resolution to continue in her widowhood. 
those widows who are but waiting the opportunity of marrying again are only widowed in externals, while in will they have already laid aside their loneliness. If the real widow chooses to confirm her widowhood by offering herself by a vow to God, she will adorn that widowhood and make her resolution doubly sure, for the remembrance that she cannot break her vow without danger of forfeiting paradise will make her so watchful over herself that a great barrier will be raised against all kind of temptation that may assail her. St. Augustine strongly recommends Christian widows to take this vow, and the learned origin goes yet further, for he advises married women to take a vow of chastity in the event of losing their husbands, so that amid the joys of married life they may yet have a share in the merits of a chaste widowhood. Vows render the actions performed under their shelter more acceptable to God, strengthen us to perform good works, and help us to devote to Him not merely those good works that are, so to say, the fruits of a holy will, but to consecrate that will itself, the source of all we do, to Him. By ordinary chastity we offer our body to God, retaining the power to return to sensual pleasure. But the vow of chastity is an absolute and irrevocable gift to Him, without any power to recall it, thereby making ourselves the happy slaves of him whose service is to be preferred to royal power. And as I greatly approve the counsels of the two venerable fathers I have named, I would have such persons as are so favored as to wish to embrace them, do so prudently, and in a holy, steadfast spirit, after careful examination of their own courage, having asked heavenly guidance and taken the advice of some discreet and pious director, and then all will be profitably done. Further, all such renunciation of second marriage must be done with a single heart in order to fix the affections more entirely on God and to seek a more complete union with Him. For if the widow retains her widowhood merely to enrich her children or for any other worldly motive, she may receive the praise of men, but not that of God, inasmuch as nothing is worthy of His approbation save that which is done for His sake. Moreover, she who would be a widow indeed must be voluntarily cut off from all worldly delights. She who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives, St. Paul says. A widow who seeks to be admired and followed and flattered, who frequents balls and parties, who takes pleasure in dressing, perfuming, and adorning herself, may be a widow in the body, but she is dead as to the soul. What does it matter, I pray you, whether the flag of Adonis and his profane love be made of white feathers or a net of crepe? Nay, sometimes there is a conscious vanity in that black is the most becoming dress, and she who thereby endeavors to captivate men and who lives in empty pleasure is dead even while she lives and is a mere mockery of widowhood. The time of pruning has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Pruning of all worldly superfluity is required of whosoever would lead a devout life, but above all it is necessary for the widow indeed, who mourns the loss of her husband like a true turtle dove. When Naomi returned from Moab to Bethlehem, those that had known her in her earlier and brighter days were moved and said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Even so, the devout widow will not desire to be called or counted beautiful or agreeable, asking no more than to be that which God wills, lowly and abject in his eyes. The lamp that is fed with aromatic oil sends forth a yet sweeter aroma when it is extinguished. And so those women whose married love was true and pure give a stronger perfume of virtue and chastity when their light, that is, their husband, is extinguished by death. Love for a husband while living is a common matter enough among women, but to love him so deeply as to refuse to take another after his death is a kind of love peculiar to her who is a widow indeed. Hope in God while resting on a husband is not so rare but to hope in him, when left alone and desolate, is a very gracious and worthy thing. And thus it is that widowhood becomes a test of the perfection of the virtues displayed by a woman in her married life. The widow who has children requiring her care and guidance 
above all in what pertains to their souls and the shaping of their lives, cannot and ought not on any wise to forsake them. St. Paul teaches this emphatically and says that he who does not provide for his relatives and especially for his own family, he has disowned the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. But if her children do not need her care, then the widow should gather together all her affections and thoughts in order to devote them more wholly to making progress in the love of God. If there is no call obliging her in conscience to attend to external secular matters, legal or other, I should advise her to leave them all alone, and to manage her affairs as quietly and peacefully as may be, even if such a course does not seem the most profitable. The fruit of disputes and lawsuits must be very great indeed before it can be compared in worth to the blessing of holy peace. Not to say that those legal entanglements and the like are essentially distracting, and often open the way for enemies who sully the purity of a heart that should be solely devoted to God. Prayer should be the widow's chief occupation. She has no love left save for God. She should scarce have aught to say to any save God, and as iron, which is restrained from yielding to the attraction of the magnet when a diamond is near, darts instantly towards it so soon as the diamond is removed, so the widow's heart, which could not rise up wholly to God or simply follow the leadings of his heavenly love during her husband's life, finds itself set free when he is dead to give itself entirely to him and cries out with the bride in the canticles, Draw me after you, let us make haste. I will be wholly thine and seek nothing save the fragrance of your anointing oils. A devout widow should chiefly seek to cultivate the graces of perfect modesty, renouncing all honors, rank, title, society, and the like vanities. She should be diligent in ministering to the poor and sick, comforting the afflicted, leading the young to a life of devotion, studying herself to be a perfect model of virtue to younger women. Necessity and simplicity should be the adornment of her garb, humility and charity of her actions, simplicity and kindliness of her words, modesty and purity of her eyes, Jesus Christ crucified, the only love of her heart. Briefly, the true widow abides in the church as a little March violet, shedding forth an exquisite sweetness through the perfume of her devotion, ever concealing herself beneath the ample leaves of her heart's lowliness while her subdued coloring indicates her mortification. She dwells in waste, uncultivated places, because she shrinks from the world's intercourse and seeks to shelter her heart from the glare with which earthly longings, whether of honors, wealth, or love itself, might dazzle her. She is happier if she remains as she is, says the holy apostle. Much more could I say on this subject, but suffice it to bid her who seeks to be a widow indeed read St. Jerome's striking letters to Salvia and the other noble ladies who rejoiced in being the spiritual children of such a father. Nothing can be said more, unless it be to warn the widow indeed not to condemn or even censure those who do resume the married life, for there are cases in which God orders it thus to his own greater glory. We must ever bear in mind the ancient teaching that in heaven, virgins, wives, and widows will know no difference save that which their true heart's humility assigns them. Chapter 41 One Word to Maidens O oh, you virgins, I have but a word to say to you. If you look to married life in this life, Guard your first love jealously for your husband. It seems to me a miserable fraud to give a husband a worn-out heart whose love has been frittered away and despoiled of its first bloom instead of a true, wholehearted love. But if you are happily called to be the chaste and holy bride of spiritual nuptials and purpose to live a life of virginity, then in Christ's name I bid you keep all your purest, most sensitive love for your heavenly bridegroom, who, being very purity himself, has a special love for purity. Him to whom the first fruits of all good things are due, above all those of love. St. Jerome's epistles will supply you with the necessary counsels, 
and inasmuch as your state of life requires obedience, seek out a guide under whose direction you may wholly dedicate yourself, body and soul, to his divine majesty. This has been Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 3, Chapters 36 through 41, by St. Francis de Sales, narrated by James T. Majewski. Production copyright 2024 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and more at catholicculture.org.